Hello and welcome to the formal review. Today, we will be having a very special episode. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome back to the formal review. This is episode 47 and I thank you all for tuning in once again. I really apologize for the lack of episodes this year. Uh, life has just been really pushing me really hard and I really just didn't have time to record and edit any episodes. However, when I say I will put out a review of the film, I will put one out as a promise. This episode is going to be a little bit of a lengthy one because I'm going to be kind of doing a 2019 movie season recap. So I won't be talking about any of the movies that I have started to see in 2020 like Bad Boys for Life. I will also be discussing the films that I haven't talked about before and ones that I have. Now, before I get started, I do want to preface with a slight spoiler warning for all the films that I have seen. I will do my best not to ruin the movie for you, but as I always say, I suggest you see the film before you hear all I have to say so you fully understand everything. But if you don't care about that, keep listening. So this year I was able to see 33 movies and feel free to check out the episodes for Reign of the Superman, Captain Marvel, Shazam, Us, Avengers Endgame, John Wick 3, Parabellum, Aladdin, Always Be My Maybe, Spider-Man Far From Home, Lion King, Toy Story 4, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw, Midsummer, The Farewell, Apocalypse Now, and It Chapter 2. Now the films that did not do episodes for were Joker, Queen and Slim, Star Wars, 1917, the Irishman, The Two Popes, Harriet, Jojo Rabbit, Judy, Little Women, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Pain and Glory, Ford vs. Ferrari, Bombshell, Richard Jewell, and Parasite. So on this episode, I'm not going to go into full details of the film, but I will give you my thoughts of them. Now, starting with Joker. Now, I really thought this was an amazing film that really gave a haunting glimpse into mental illness while also being a comic book movie. Now, it really never ever felt like one, but I thought that was for the better. It allowed audience members to really feel uncomfortable, but on a realistic scale. I thought Todd Phillips' direction was very good, and from a technical aspect, it is probably flawless. Each shot was done for a reason, and Phillips really wants his audience to understand this character even though they do not agree with him. While he does take a lot of inspiration from Scorsese films, Taxi Driver and the King of Comedy, it still works well as he pays a lot of homage to his film. The film score by Hildur Guana Dottir, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, and the cinematography by Lauren Scher are beautiful to say the least, to tell a story about outsiders and the ignored, but it is even more complicated than that. It touches on a lot of current events and attaching that to a comic book movie really makes its message a lot stronger. The film takes a lot of interesting twists and turns and takes away any sympathy the audience has toward its titular character as the film progresses. This is a story about a very psychotic villain and how he came about. Now what writer and director Phillips and co-writer Silver, who also worked on 8 Mile and The Fighter, have also written an amazing case study of the mental, moral, emotional, and physical makeup of a man who became the Joker. As an origin story, this film is somewhat based on the 1988 graphic novel Batman the Killing Joke, and here also Phillips embraces what Nolan did in his Batman films. He shows a flawed, brutal, broken-hearted city that is really comparable to its title of character. Both are oppressive and oppressed, and Phillips liked to show Gotham as this huge entity and showed how far away Arthur lived from the downtown, but also how different he was from the 1% of Gotham, such as the Wayne family. He made it seem that Arthur was only a very small piece of what made Gotham what it was, a corrupt and very problematic city. Now, Phoenix plays this troubled character absolutely amazingly. And honestly, no matter who your favorite Joker is, Phoenix definitely places himself up there with them. This film dives more into why the Joker was the way he was. His mindset is almost similar to the Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. He kills a few people, but because they're awful human beings. And everyone loses their minds. Even though a majority of people would agree with his thought that they were terrible. He's just willing to kill them because of it, which is obviously a little bit of an extreme. He becomes similar in this sense to his eventual arch nemesis, Batman. He is willing to kill people in the name of what he thinks is justice, whereas Batman would take him to the police. Well, at least in theory. Batman has killed before in multiple renditions. Now, 
Phoenix embraces this character and really moves into one of the best actors of the current time. If you did not see last year's film, you were never really here. You should, because that's another film that really showcases his acting ability. And honestly, I do think it may be a little bit better than this, but the dedication to this film is definitely there. Phillips is able to keep the camera on him and lets the audience not only see him, but also feel him. One cannot help but cringe when his ribs seemed to protrude like daggers from his body. Phoenix stated that 100% necessary for him to have this tiny, delicate frame as he helped carry out the iconic comic book's villain's movements and mannerisms. And then he lost 52 pounds for this role, which really shows how this man not is only mentally unhealthy, but also physically unhealthy. And I really love the choice that Phillips did with the character and his laugh. He really made it this additional disorder that the character had. And this added a lot of pain to whenever he laughed. And every time, essentially, that you see Arthur on the screen, he is in some sort of pain. One other thing that I really loved about the film is how Phillips really shows how this character develops over the course of this film in the opposite way of a lot of stories. He changes a lot over it, so much so to become essentially a mere image of himself at the end of the film. In the opening scene of the film, you see him move his face into a smile, then into a frown. This is obviously a reference into the sock and busk in which are the two ancient symbols of comedy and tragedy with the sad face on the left and the laughing face on the right. Now, when you read English, obviously you read from left to right. And this is how the Joker progresses in the course of the film. He goes from tragedy to comedy, well, at least in his mind. And this film dials into this transition from life to rep, even showing on a via a tear. At the beginning of the film, when the audience sees Arthur, he has a tear going down the audience's left side of his face. And as he walks up to be on Arthur Murray's show, the tear is then shown on the right side of the audience. Now, Phillips makes a lot of these types of choices in the film. He shows a lot of opposites, such as Arthur going up a long staircase every day to home in agony. And then at the end of the film, he descends down it in happiness. At the beginning of the film, Arthur barely gets missed being hit by a car when he's chasing the kids and then gets beat up after them. At the end of the film, as he's being chased by the two police officers, he gets hit by the car, gets up, and they get beat up, or possibly killed. I'm not really sure with that one. And the film starts off with Arthur crying, but then ends up with him smiling and laughing. I really love this transition, because it shows how much someone can change and become such a dark character. One could really choose to be a hero or a villain, but really, it's based on their perspective and their values. To anyone really who has a problem with how dark this character is, I really think you don't understand the character. The Joker has always been absolutely psychotic. Even in the comics to cut off his own face and pin it to a wall. He then returned wearing his own decomposing face as a mask. So that's something he's willing to do to himself for fun. Now imagine what he would do to somebody he didn't like. And so no matter how much this film is trying not to be a comic book film, at the end of the day, it is one. The source material of how psychotic this man is, is out there. So I'm really unsure what you were expecting going into the Joker film. You're gonna get a psychotic person. Even if you look at how the character was portrayed in the past Batman films, he's not that sane either. And he's really willing to do things that aren't exactly humane. My really only flaw with this film is that it's an obviously inspired by Scorsese films, like I said. While this isn't really a big flaw and it doesn't really impede the viewing, it does show, in my opinion at least, a lack of originality from the writing perspective. A film can be done really well, but it is essentially a copy of another film's story. But if it's a, essentially a copy of another film's story, it's not really original. Now, before anyone listening gets all mad about this flaw, I will say I have these same issues with any film that does this. The Dark Knight is very similar to Michael Mann's Heat. Tarantino is very similar to doing stories with his films from Japanese films, taking different characters and putting them in the exact same storyline. And even Star Wars, the original, is a ripoff of an older film. Now, before I get into the rating of this film, I do want to give my interpretation of the ending. Now, this section is going to be spoiler heavy, so if you haven't seen the film, which at this point it's a little late, but whatever, I would recommend that you kind of skip ahead so you don't get this ruined for you. So here's a countdown. Three, two, one.
Okay, you've been warned. Here's the spoilers. At the end of the film, the viewer does not know how much of the film was real or in Joker's mind. Now, to me, I feel that a lot of the film was in his mind, and thus everything that the audience sees is either fake or just from a different point of view. Phillips has said that there was some inspiration from the killing joke, like I talked about, and prior to seeing this film, I was talking to a bunch of people about possibly getting an origin story of the Joker. Now, they had problems with the idea of the Joker having a specific origin story. This would then thus not be true to the character. So, if you've read the comics, you know that there are new numerous stories of how the Joker became the Joker. The Killing Joke also establishes this similar failing comic story like the movie does. But it also has one specific line of dialogue that I think is the key reason why this film takes place in his mind. Sometimes I remember it one way, sometimes another. If I'm going to have a past, I prefer it to be multiple choices. Now this line to me really establishes the true story of the Joker. No one really knows his true origin because he's so insane that you can't even trust him if he was telling the truth. So it's kind of catch-22. You want to know, but is he trustworthy enough of a person to tell you the truth even if he is telling you the truth? I think that's such an interesting dynamic for a character. And this film really dives right into that. Joker's insanity is truly shown throughout the film. And even so that this character piece is not trustworthy. The film is Joker as essentially a hero and he or his actions created Batman. Now this is the exact opposite of what most stories of Batman involve. Even Thomas Wayne is the opposite. Aside Flashpoint, but that's a whole different timeline. I'm not going to get into that. And then there's this stepbrother portion. Now I don't think this part is true, but I do think Philip showed Arthur being mentally unstable similar to his mother. I don't think that he was the ill legitimate child of Thomas Wayne. I do think that it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I say this because he is a person who really wants to be accepted by society and what would the best way to be accepted is by the richest people in the city. And obviously Thomas Wayne sees him and no, you're not part of my family. Why should I accept you? Now, if you're on the opposite side of that, it's almost like your dream has been destroyed, which is symbolically shown through Thomas Wayne punching him in the face. Some people can make the argument that, yeah, he's the richest guy, he could make this cover-up happen, but I don't think that's the case here. The main reason is because the film over and over again shows that Arthur is not a trustworthy character. His relationship with Sophie is not real, and I think even their first interaction in the elevator was all a part of his mind. He seemingly hears Sophie complain about the oldness of the building, but then her daughter says the exact same line again and says, Mommy, did you hear me? She replies yes, then points her fingers. Now this leads Arthur to obviously doing the same joke as, as she walks away nervously. Now one could say that children repeat what their parents say all the time, but hear me out on this one. Their quote unquote relationship has them going on dates and interacting as a normal couple. But in these scenes, Sophie's daughter is nowhere to be seen. So I think Arthur doesn't even choose to recognize her. My thought is that the daughter complains first, but his mind changes it to Sophie's thing. So it gives them a reason to interact. He obviously created their relationship in his mind. So what stops him from creating everything, including their first ever interaction? He is not a trustworthy storyteller. And you cannot trust what he says he heard to be true either. The songs in the movie are shown to be playing in his head. There are numerous times in the film of him being the only person who hears these songs. At the end of the film, why would he start saying that's life as the song plays over? As I said, I think Phillips does everything in this movie for a reason. It is absolutely deliberate. The name Arthur Fleck is not even reliable of who he was because he's adopted by a mentally unstable woman. You can't even trust her to tell you where he came from. It is possible that maybe the boyfriend of her beat her and the Joker knew. It is possible that maybe the boyfriend that beat her was probably told by her that the Joker was Thomas Wayne's son. So that's why he beat her and that's why there was a tense relationship. 
Obviously, this would then lead to the abuse. But even then, how do we know that her story isn't a fabrication as well? Some may be turned off by this, but I think it adds a lot of aspects to the character and makes the film a true showing of the Joker character. He is just as ambiguous as his storytelling, and we may never know his precise origin story. Now, that's just my interpretation of it. However, again, my main issue with this film is that it is a slight ripoff, but it does glimpse into the mind of one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Batman villains of all time. And it is definitely well made. The acting is phenomenal. The score is fantastic. Definitely one of the top comic book movies ever made. And separates itself from the majority of comic book films as a genre. Phillips and Phoenix have altered the course of comic book movies in the best way possible. By creating a dark yet bold film about one of the most iconic villains in cinematic history. I would rate this a 4.5 out of 5 both times. I want to give a shout out to Alina Waith because her writing is amazing. For those who do not know who she is, she played Denise on Netflix Master of None, where she won an Emmy for the Thanksgiving episode that she wrote. Since then, I knew her writing was great and I could not wait for this film. I knew that she would not disappoint and she definitely did not. She was able to take the story of Bonnie and Clyde and turn it on its head. She was able to show how the hypocrisy of African American men and women in the United States are treated in comparison to the white men and women. If you compare the two versions of Bonnie and Clyde by themselves, you can see they have similar pasts but to different outcomes. During the Depression, Bonnie and Clyde robbed banks and were outlaws. They killed at least nine police officers and four civilians. But they were portrayed back then as adventurers and people glorified them. They broke the law but were looked at as action heroes. When they died, over 10,000 people showed up to their funeral. One of the movies that was based on their lives was portrayed as a romance story and to this day, people still think of them in a positive light. Now fast forward to Queen and Slim. This film tells the story of two innocent people who were forced to run from the law because it was better than being put into jail or potentially killed. One may think that when this happens, they should have gone to the police instead of running. However, that is your privilege talking. These two people in this film are going to be looked at as criminals no matter what they do. If they run, at least they have a chance of being free and not dead. Yes, there's an argument to be made that our justice system should work and they should be fine if they turn themselves in. However, that system doesn't work 100% of the time and it doesn't treat every person the same. The media even in this movie portrays them as criminals even though they are innocent where Bonnie and Clyde were heroes when they weren't in actuality. They killed many people. Queen and Slim were coming home from a date, minding their own business business and cooperating with the police officer who pulled them over. You shouldn't be shot or killed during a routine traffic stop. Their fleeing is at first an act of self-preservation. Queen is the defense attorney. She knows that they will not get a fair trial if they turn themselves in. Now, I do want to also point out that Bonnie and Clyde received Oscars for Best Supporting Actor and Best Cinematography and is in the National Film Registry. I can't say this film it won't be in the National Film Registry because that does take place over time, but this film did not get a single nomination. This film also looks into that there is a difference between how women in general and more specifically African American women are treated in comparison to the male counterparts. Queen is the one who is always thinking what they should do next, but Slim tries to keep on wanting to go home and see his family. The final scene has him even holding her like Superman held Supergirl after Crisis in the comics. And Superman is always looked at as the stronger of the two, but this film shows over and over again that that is not the case here. They do the same activity, such as jumping out of a window. He does it, comes off without a scratch. She does the same thing and gets hurt. And this goes into similar things of what I was talking about with Joker is that everything is done for a reason and is shown in a certain way. But this film, it also shows how stereotyping is wrong and then that there are many different African Americans. They aren't only gangsters and thugs as a lot of films in the past have shown them. There are lawyers, there are pimps, there are mechanics, bartenders, and obviously many more than that. Just like there are many different types of whites, Latinxes, and Asians. And this is shown through the music that transitions throughout the film and also the visuals, thanks to Melina Matsukas' direction. The music transitions from blues to R&B to hip-hop as they travel more south. 
And when they get to New Orleans, they have them even changing their hair and clothes and hiding in plain sight at a bar. And a few people still recognize them, and Matsukis has Queen wearing this tiger skin that you see in the poster. Now, there is one shot in this film that has her standing in front of a mural of Jaguar. I think Matsukis knows precisely what she's doing in this scene. And she shows how Queen is standing and hiding, but she still stands out because she has stripes and they have spots. And I think that this comes from Matsukis' experience in the music video industry. In addition, Matsukis not only brings these two characters on this journey, she takes her time with it. She builds this relationship between them in this stressful time. She allows the relationship to grow because they realize that they only have each other. And even if they know that they may not make it, they can enjoy their last moments together. Daniel Kaluuya and Jody Turner-Smith have some great chemistry. Though I will say that their characters are not the most developed, however, I don't think that this is a really big flaw in the film, if it is one, because as a viewer, you're not meant to know anything about them, because that's not even how they are viewed by the rest of the world. Anything prior to that night does not matter. The media will say that after this night, she's an absolute criminal, and it doesn't matter that she was a defense attorney. Their story started over when the police officer was shot. Their real names aren't even identified until the end of the film, because that did not matter until then. These two characters represent hopes, dreams, fears, hatreds of a specific community, and they have tremendous emotional power. For those who have not seen this movie, I could not recommend it anymore. Five out of five Botox. Now, okay, so this third film is definitely a little complicated. And if you have been following me on social media, you know that I'm a very big Star Wars fan. I rewatched the entire series, including the spin-offs Rogue One and Solo. And yes, the series hasn't overall always been good, but it is still a great time and it's still fun. This time was especially great to rewatch all the films because it was the first time I had watched it on my new surround sound system and also on Blu-rays. Every other time was VHS or DVD. And there are definitely things that I liked about this film and things that I didn't. The main thing that I think is the problem is how rushed it felt. It basically had to correct a lot of the things or kind of erase what happened in The Last Jedi. Now, I'm not the biggest hater on that film, as some are, but I do recognize that it has problems, such as the casino side mission. For the first half of this film, it felt like it was just overcorrecting it, and everything was just boom, 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 boom. Then I was like, okay, like we're just accepting this. It was one line of dialogue. For example, the introduction of Palpatine returning even felt rushed. The dead speak. Okay, he's back. Am I just supposed to accept this now? The film tries to give explanations for it, but it never really lands. It's one or two lines of dialogue, and that's unfortunately how the entire film progresses. Any missing detail is giving one line of dialogue to explain something. Why does Rey know about force healing? Because she had the books. Why does Bay happen? Because they are a force dying. Having said that, if you can get past those simple explanations, the film is quite enjoyable. Yes, the film has issues for sure when it comes to storytelling, but I think the action is pretty great. The character stories are good or okay at best, though the film does try to push the Kyle Ren story more here than in the past films, but somewhat contradicts the prior two films because Rey was the main character. So I think trying to switch that again to focus on Kylo Ren slash Ben is kind of problematic. Poe and Finn, I think, work well together, but Finn's interesting Stormtrooper story that they brought up in the first of this trilogy is barely alluded to. I did really like what they did with Leia, giving that all footage in this film was prior to Carrie Fisher's unfortunate passing. So it works in that aspect. That is my overall feel of this film. It was fine, given what it had to do. I enjoyed it, and I would be fine with the Skywalker story ending here. I will admit I do have to fill in a lot with my own explanations, but I feel that this could get better with future watchings. Whereas The Last Jedi couldn't get worse, which... Unfortunately, it's going down the prequel lane. A three out of five bow ties. So we'll... Oh, 
voting isn't just going to the polls anymore on election day. Options like early voting, mail-in voting, and ballot drop boxes are available to more voters and are growing in popularity. How to Vote is a tool created by Democracy Works, and it breaks down the options your state offers by forecasting a ballot, empowering you to decide where and when to vote. Democracy works best when we all vote, but misinformation and confusion about election procedures have resulted in low voter turnout. How to Vote takes the guesswork out of the voting process. It is easy to use and helps folks from all over the country overcome many of the process barriers to voting. It is committed to helping you vote no matter what. You can use the How to Vote tool to sign up for election reminders, see what's on your ballot, get step-by-step assistance requesting your mail ballot, explore your options for returning your mail-in ballot, check your voter registration status, and find your local polling site and make sure that you have an appropriate ID to bring with you. Decide when and where you'll vote this year at howto.vote. Cold War I movies are few and far between. The one that is known is All Quiet on the Western Front, and that came out in 1930. There are very few other films that take place during World War I, such as War Horse, but I wouldn't call those war movies per se. 1917 is a war movie. Sam Mendes made this film to appear as one continuous take, which is impressive by itself from a technical aspect. This allows the audience to feel that they are right there in the trenches and on the battlefield with these two men. You are seeing what they are seeing and feeling what they are feeling. You are in a war with them and trying to get this message to the right people so less people will die. The film looks amazing thanks to some great cinematography by Roger Deakins. And he keeps the war horrors absolutely realistic with the audience as they cross France. Deakins and Mendez work extremely well together to keep their audience extremely immersed in this film. The score of this film is absolutely fantastic by Thomas Newman, and this film honestly does what Saving Private Ryan did for World War II and what Platoon did for the Vietnam War. It shows the horrors of combat for viewers in a very different time, and knowing how bad trench warfare really was helped me understand and connect with these two characters. Otherwise, there really wasn't much development to them at all, which is really the film's only but very problematic flaw. If you do not know how bad trench warfare was, you may not connect with them as much. And that's been dissimilar of Dunkirk, just to compare films. It's a really well-made film, but character-wise, eh, could be a lot better. But I do think that this film is not about them. It's about the war and visually showing you how bad World War I really was, how tense it was. I think these two characters are there to help the audience on this journey. Even the ending is horrifying because, spoiler warning, they accomplished their mission, but to what end? The war is still going on and people are still going to be killed, but just less. It's very tragic, but also very realistic. And honestly, this film is a technical masterpiece. But really, like I said, lacks on characters. And it is extremely enjoyable to watch, especially in the theaters. A four and a half out of five bow ties. Now, for those listening, y'all know that one of my favorite directors of all time, if not my favorite, is Martin Scorsese. I love his style and craft in all of his films, which is probably why I like Joker so much. He has created some of the most iconic movies in cinematic history. And his style is second to none, covering most famously the mob, but also religion and tragic characters. So when I heard that he was coming out with a new mob film, I was absolutely ecstatic. Then, when I learned that he was going to star his frequent collaborator Robert De Niro, I was even more excited. And then I learned that Joe Pesci and Al Pacino were going to be in the movie. I knew I was going to like this film no matter what. So I will say that my feelings toward this film may be a tad biased. I'm a big fan of gangster films, and this film is essentially a tribute to this genre of movie, and really may be perhaps one of the last ever made. I can't predict the future, so I don't actually know that, but I will say there's not really a director in Hollywood currently that I would say, oh, he or she is the next Martin Scorsese. And in addition to that, the mafia really isn't as pertinent as it once was as a topic of public interest. De Niro here is absolutely fantastic as playing this closed off, unreachable character, and Pesci and Pacino are also absolutely fantastic in their roles. And a lot of the supporting actors in this film are also great in their respective roles. The film, however, 
does have issues. Though I do think that the de-aging worked well for the most part. One scene where Dean Nero is beating up a store clerk for pushing his daughter. His face looked young, but his movements were from a man twice his age. And it took me out of the film a little bit. And I have to discuss that three and a half hour runtime. It is too long. I don't mean I felt bad watching it and each moment was entertaining as it is a part of the overall story. However, this issue is because it affects its rewatchability. And unfortunately for this film, there's not a lot of it and most likely won't happen for me. Yes, the mob story is good. Yes, the acting is great. Yes, Scorsese's direction is fantastic. However, the overall film is not really unique in any way, aside from the runtime. It is a good way to spend three and a half hours, but you really don't need to go down that journey again. The story is adapted from Charles Brandt's book, I Heard You Paint Houses, which is written by a man who historians look down upon because they look see him as a man trying to get a quick buck and it's not really an accurate story now this does make for an entertaining story for a film but it really takes out the realistic Scorsese effect which he has done very well with true stories before he's done fictional films too but those are done in a way that they're obviously fictional whereas this film is done as a true story having said all that I'm not disappointed with the film as a whole and it was a very well made but again Again, the rewatchability really drags this film down. 4.5 out of 5 bucks. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Two hopes enter, one hope lives. Let's get ready to rumble! Y'all ready for this? Nah, I'm just kidding. This film is actually about imagined conversations between two men who have different points of view when it comes to God and the Catholic Church. While the interactions between these two men are fake, their discussion topics are real between a lot of Catholics today. You have one side represented by Benedict, who are conservative and want the church to stay the same as it always been. Then you have the other side represented by the eventual current Pope Francis, who are more progressive. The acting by Anthony Hopkins and Jonathan and Price are absolutely fantastic. They are both serious, angry, whimsical, and hilarious at times. The film is very charming and feels very grounded, but its message of conversation is very strong. My only other flaw with this film is that it has this falsehood about it, and a casual viewer who has no idea about the Catholic Church might think that Francis cares about the poor and the environment, while Benedict cares only about tradition and rules. Benedict did care for the poor and the rights of migrants and refugees and had environmental concerns. And this friendship that the overall film shows is completely fake in real life. However, that's the only flaw that I can find in the film. But this film is made as historical fiction. It is not a reality. A lot of this film shows this. Even so much that the real Benedict wasn't as conservative as this. Nor Francis being as progressive as this film makes them both. Who they represent is the most important part. As I said, these types of Catholics do exist and their conversations are real between them. Is it actually a flaw? I would say no, because it's marketed as a historical fiction. It's not made to be 100% realistic. It's just using two real people, but fictionalizing everything else around it. And it doesn't really affect the overall viewing. I really enjoyed the film, the message, and the acting of the two starring men. 5.5 out of 5 bow ties. The thing <laughs> the Julia Roberts once was thought to play this character is absolutely abhorring to me on so many levels. One is the obvious one, and the other is that that was 25 years ago. We have had so many biopics made, some are needed and some not, but not one about the slave turned abolitionist named Harriet Tubman. Her story speaks for itself on why it should be made, not only 25 years ago, but even before that. This is just as mind-blowing to me that only one film has been made about Martin Luther King, but it's not even really about his entire life. Don't get me wrong, Selma is a film that I really enjoy, but it's hard to believe that such influential people have not made multiple films about. But we have a lot of unneeded sequels and unneeded remakes. That's the end of my rant. This film is a good movie and it is well acted by Cynthia Ervio as Tubman and Leslie Odom Jr. and Janelle Monet. Now knowing that these three were involved with this movie, I knew that any of the songs from this film would be absolute fire. And I was not wrong. Monet is obviously known for her work as a singer and producer, but Odom and Ervio are from the musical theater world. Odom is a very decent singer coming from Hamilton, but Ervio is absolutely amazing 
I heard her in the musical version of The Color Purple and have been in love with her voice ever since. This is her third film, but her first primary headliner role. And she does an amazing job playing Harriet as this rebellious slave and the action hero that she was. The main issue with this film is that it is a very typical biopic about a historical figure's life. Checking all the boxes, and then yes, it has an epilogue about the rest of her lives next to old photographs. However, that is not the fault of this movie. That is the fault of the overall genre that it falls in. I think the message here is strong. It is about for the quest of freedom and the powerful performance by Erbio about a phenomenal woman who wanted freedom freedom, not only for herself, but for everyone. Four out of five votes. So when I first saw the trailer for this movie, I thought, this really looks like Wes Anderson directed The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. And then I saw who was directing with it, and I groaned. Now, I haven't seen all of Taika Waititi's films, but I really wasn't the biggest fan of his work in Thor Ragnarok. I thought the humor went on too long and was really forced, and I thought this film was going to be really bad. After watching it, I stand corrected on one of those two points. Waititi actually put together a well-done film! This film will make you laugh, cry, and feel angry. It is simply about a little German boy who idolizes Hitler, and even has an imaginary version of him giving him advice, played wonderfully by Waititi himself. One day he finds out that his mother is hiding a Jewish girl in their house, and he's extremely torn because if he turns this Jewish girl in, his mother has to be turned in as well for hiding her. And I think this film is well acted by everybody, and each role works well within Waititi's world. The humor is well placed and delivered by everyone exquisitely. This is perhaps, in my opinion, one of Scarlett Johansson's best roles. Prior to this, I really only thought she was good, and not even amazing in The Prestige. Every other film, she's been decent, don't get me wrong, but it's not anything strong. This film, I think, is at the top of her list. This film takes Germany's worst and makes points about the state of the world today to learn from history and to be a better version of themselves. YT tells this somewhat old message, but in very subtle, but also obvious ways at times, in a very coherent and touching story. The hardest thing for me to believe is that this is technically a Disney film, as it was released by Fox Searchlight Pictures, which Disney owns. Five out of five bow ties. For someone who grew up on Wizard of Oz and musicals, my liking of Julie Garland is not unexpected. With that, I did know prior to this film that her life was very tragic, especially in the later part of her life. She was a person who had a lot of expectations for her from a very young age. She was called cute or the perfect friend, but never beautiful. She was forced to take drugs to stop eating, which kept her awake, but then she would have to take more drugs so that she could sleep. The film shows how that affected her later life and Zellweger does a very good job portraying the last days of a beloved performer. The audience feels her struggle and her story and it does a really good job at showing how her childhood influenced her later life and really has some cringe worthy moments. My biggest problem with this film is that it takes a lot of the liberties with the story for entertainment purposes. Certain people were in places that they weren't or they were doing things that did not happen in real life. In comparison to the two popes, this film is supposedly true, whereas the two popes is marketed as fiction. And also, the songs do sound fairly decent, with Del Weger providing a good amount of the vocals, but they do not look as good as they sound. There are multiple times throughout the film where it was really obvious she was lip syncing her own voice. In a movie that's about one of the best singers during the 1900s, messing up how she sings is obviously very problematic. I'm not sure how much of the times that they were notes that Del Weger could not hit, but at the end of the film, I did feel for her and it hit me right in the gut knowing who Garland actually was. This film is obviously a tribute to her and it does a decent job at that. However, to tell the viewers this is how it happened is false. At the end of the day, Del Weger is good enough for this film to watch. Just don't take it for 100% facts. Four out of five bow ties. So the next film, you'll have to tune into the next episode. Sorry about that, y'all. But this review session was just too long to be kept on as one episode. My next episode will conclude the two-part episode. But until then, why don't you tell me what you love these films? Hit me up on social media, The Formal Reviews, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. The URLs are all the same. It's at The Formal Review. Thank you all for tuning in once again, and I really appreciate listening. So you don't miss the next episode. Please subscribe to your favorite streaming service, The Formal Reviews, on Spotify, iTunes, Google Music, and my 
much more pretty much anywhere that has podcasts as with every episode i do have music in the background i do not own the rights to this music but i put it into show support to each film this is an important part of a film and can really bring the audience into the film's environment this episode's music is from each film's original soundtracks so thank you all for tuning in once again until the next episode i'll see you at the movies take care Thanks everyone for tuning into this episode of the formal review we hope you'll join us again 